times in man's history when little thoughts just won't do. When the routine, the accepted, the obvious, the smug, the easy answers are no answers at all. Here are souvenirs of a few such times in the rise of American air power. Old class photos. An outdated army field manual. A map. And a few words on White House stationery. Each is humble testimony to the imagination of bold, decisive men. Our mastery of the air today, our leap into space tomorrow, began with this order from the 26th President of the United States. Mr. Roosevelt directed the Secretary of War, Mr. Taft, to look into a flying machine that had been invented by some people named Wright. It was high time. In the three years since Kitty Hawk, only a few zealots had noticed that aviation had been born. Wilbur Wright and his younger brother Orville had continued their experiments, alternating as pilots in the prone. During 1904, they made 105 flights over a cow pasture near Dayton, steering their motor-driven flyer around circles and S-shaped courses, staying up as long as five minutes and reaching an average speed of 35 miles an hour. So they wrote to their congressman on business letterhead. After describing the achievements of the past year, Orville added, Flying has been brought to a point where it can be made of great practical use in various ways, one of which is that of scouting and carrying messages in time of war. The congressman bucked the letter straight to the War Department. My dear Mr. Secretary, I have been skeptical as to the practicability of any so-called flying machine. Until I was convinced by others there was really something in the gentlemen's ideas, as they only want to present the result of their labors without expense to the government, I would respectfully ask for them the privilege of demonstrating what they have and what they can do back came an answer in three days. I have the honor to inform you that as many requests have been made for financial assistance in the development of flying machines, the board has determined that before suggestions will be considered, the device must have been brought to the stage of practical operation without expense to the United States. Orville tried again nine months later. We are prepared to furnish a machine on contract to be accepted only after trial trips. I have the honor to inform you that as many requests have been made for financial development without expense to the United States. But there was also a suggestion of interest. Before the question of a contract is considered, it will be necessary for you to furnish the approximate cost of the completed machine, the date upon which it would be delivered, and drawings and descriptions thereof. We have no thought of asking financial assistance. We propose to sell the results of experiments finished at our own expense. It is desirable that we be informed what conditions you would wish to lay down as to the performance of the machine in the official trials. The board does not care to formulate any requirements for the performance of a flying machine. By routine standards, the board had made a sound decision. They had just spent $50,000 to finance the highly publicized aerodrome of Dr. Samuel Langley, which had been catapulted from a houseboat only to plunge into the Potomac tail first. Critics were still sounding off about it in Congress and the press. If Langley, a distinguished scientist and the secretary of the Smithsonian had failed, who could believe that two small-time bicycle manufacturers had succeeded? Where was the man bold enough to believe and to act? Fortunately, he was here 
in the new executive wing that had been built to his order. Mr. Roosevelt learned of the Wright's invention in 1907 from members of the Aero Club, a group whose major interest was in balloon flying as a sport. His reaction was immediate, and he got results. A specification listing the characteristics wanted in the world's first military airplane, and a contract with the Wright brothers to build it. To move things along, the president also provided the money out of funds left over from the Spanish-American War. The plane brought to Fort Myer, Virginia in 1908 allowed the pilot to sit up, sacrificing the lower wind resistance of the prone position to improved observation. And there was an extra seat for a passenger. It performed beautifully. But halfway through the trials, a brace wire fouled one propeller, and it crashed, injuring Orville, and killing the Army observer, Lieutenant Thomas Selfridge. It was not until August of 1909 that the Army could take delivery on its first set of wings. Like all the Wright Flyers, it was a pusher type. That is, the two propellers were mounted just back of the wings. It was made of cotton cloth and wood and fully loaded with two thin men aboard and 13 gallons of gas. It weighed about 1,200 pounds. This small four-cylinder engine drove both propellers through these chains which are behind me. Major General Benjamin Fulloy was on the board of officers that accepted the 1909 plane. There wasn't much in the way of luxury. You sat on the leading edge of the lower wing. Your feet rested on a crossbar. The speed was uh, regulated before the takeoff. The outboard lever next to your seat moved the elevator up front, controlling altitude. The split lever between the seats served two purposes. One part turned the rudder, The other warped the wings to change the angle of attack for lateral control, as ailerons are used today. Normally, both parts of the lever work together to perform a banking turn. The only flying instrument we had on old number one at that time was a piece of tape about two feet long attached to the front crossbar. If it swung to the side, you were skidding. If it inclined upward, watch out for a stall. On my second flight at Fort Sam Houston, I stalled it down there and came down and banged it all up. Then I sat down and wrote to the Wright brothers and told them what I'd done. They wrote back and told me what I ought to have done. As a, as a result of those instructions I received from the Wright brothers, I probably qualified as the first correspondence pilot in history. But that was later. At Fort Myer, I went along as the official observer and navigator. In the final acceptance trials, Orville Wright did all the piloting. His passenger for the endurance test was Lieutenant Frank Lahm, the Army's most celebrated balloon pilot, and one of the men who had briefed President Roosevelt two years before. The object of the test was sustained flight with two people aboard for an hour. A catapult was set up demonstrating the capability of taking off from any kind of terrain. Orville circled the drill field again and again until he had exceeded the hour by 12 and a half minutes. With Lieutenant Folloy observing, he flew five miles to Alexandria and back at 42 and a half miles an hour, and the plane was accepted. 7,000 people journeyed to Fort Myer for the fun, but Theodore Roosevelt, now out of office, missed it. The following year in St. Louis, however, he climbed into a Wright Flyer himself with very little enthusiasm. Once in the air, he waved at the cheering crowds below until Arch Hoxie, the pilot, pleaded with him to stop. He was the first president to fly. Time, 1918. 
Frankfurt over France. That's our plane on the right, a Spad. The German is a Hanover honor. Now, this dogfight raises a question. Why are we in a French Spad? Because in World War I, we had no combat planes of our own. Most of our missions were flown in British and French planes. We plunged into the war with promises and threats, but with few planes and little plants. This was the aircraft industry, a dozen modest factories from which the Army had purchased exactly 153 planes since the big day at Fort Myer. The most useful being the Curtis Jenny, a primary trainer. We tried to grow up. In 18 months, we turned out 7,000 Jennies, 16,000 American-designed Liberty engines. But the only combat plane we produced was a British reconnaissance bomber, the DH-4, modified for the Liberty engine. 3,000 were built. 1,200 reached France. 300 got into the fight. The lesson burned deep in the mind of Army pilot number 14, one of the pioneers trained by the Wrights, and now a desk-bound colonel in Washington. 20 years later, in his drive for more and more production, General Hap Arnold was still remembering that lesson. Lesson two, how should planes be used? Just to fight off other planes? No, an aeroplane is not a defensive weapon. This is Hugh Trenchard, Royal Air Force speaking. It is a weapon of attack, Major. You attack the enemy on his side of the line, incessantly. General Trenchard's visitor was a middle-aged man in a hurry, who had learned to fly only the year before, paying for the lessons himself because regulations said he was too old. As a young lieutenant in the Signal Corps, he had strung telegraph wire across the wilderness of Alaska, but for years, Billy Mitchell had thought and talked and written about the possibilities of war in the air. In 1917, he was in France, a sort of self-appointed advance man for the AEF, traveling all over the Allied front by borrowed plane and car, observing air war in action. Of course, in my spare moments, I took every opportunity to hunt with the inhabitants. Within 15 months, he was Chief of Air Service, First Army, and a legend began. I had an amazing map of the whole San Miel salient where we were about to attack. Every incident of the terrain was remarkably depicted. I felt I knew this part of the world as well as any man. The German salient at San Miel had been sticking into the Allied lines for four years. Pershing was determined to wipe it out. I decided to employ massed air attacks against the vital points in the enemy's rear, hitting first from one side of the salient, then from the other, just like a boxer. Mitchell had 1,500 planes under his command, and during the two weeks of preparation, except for routine patrols, he kept most of them under wraps. But for the attack, he got 1,482 into the air, overwhelming the Germans five to one. He repeated this performance in the final Meuse-Argonne offensive and went home a general and a hero. Then he became a tragic hero and a prophet. I wondered how soon we should have to come back to Europe in arms again. The lean years return for air-minded military men, except on the blackboards of the Air Corps Tactical School. The school was a small operation, a thousand students between the two big wars. 
but among them were Major Spatz, Captain Chenault, Lieutenant Vandenberg, Lieutenant Twining, Lieutenant White, Lieutenant Power, and Lieutenant LeMay. The tactical school's search for doctrine led them far afield to a study of the nature of industrial economies, for example. Mitchell had talked of bombing deep into the enemy's country. But how do you select the targets? Fortunately, we ran into the case of the variable pitch propeller. One day, back in the mid-30s, we discovered that a shipment of planes was coming in without propellers. And it wasn't the fault of the plane manufacturer. The propellers required a highly specialized spring for their operation. There was only one factory in the country that made these springs. It was in Pittsburgh, and the flood had put it temporarily out of operation. In a war, therefore, destroying that one small factory would paralyze the whole industry and ground the planes. This led us to one of the new concepts. Daylight precision bombing. Thus, in World War II, when Operation Torch came along, airmen looked for opportunities to put 20 years of hard thinking to work. But the invasion began under the prevailing doctrine of local protection, which meant that Air Force planes flew into North Africa to be parceled out among the ground commanders. in strength wherever they chose, and they clobbered us. Our planes were spread too thin. Our losses were twice theirs. to change, and the change came in mid-battle. All air units were placed in a single air command under General Carl Spatz, who reported to the theater commander, General Eisenhower. Now, with the whole theater to work over, bombers could concentrate on priority targets, airfields, supply lines, ports, and shipping. Fighter sweeps increased fourfold, and soon it was the Luftwaffe that was losing planes two to one. supreme in the air. North Africa was so conclusive that the War Department issued a new field service regulation on air doctrine. Essentially, it put the stamp of official approval on the concepts of the old tactical school. The key sentences could have been written by Billy Mitchell himself. Air superiority is the first requirement for the success of any major operation.
flexibility of air power is its greatest asset. Its whole weight can be employed against selected areas in turn. To exploit this flexibility, the control of air power must be centralized. In the closing hours of World War II, the power to destroy an enemy from the air reached a new order of magnitude. A simple formula. One plane, one bomb, one target. There was no more room for doubt. Certainly not in the minds of the men who had done the job. Generals Arnold and Spatz quickly set up a strategic air command as the nucleus of the post-war Air Force. Curtis LeMay, whose imagination and daring in the great raids had made him a general a few short years after tactical school. LeMay took over SAC in 48, the year the first intercontinental bomber, the B-36, was introduced. For almost a decade, on through the conversion to the massive B-52 jets, SAC and LeMay were as one. The level of combat readiness achieved then and maintained ever since has been unequaled in military history and has been one of the most important deterrents to keep the Cold War on ice. In the operation of a deterrent, if today's mission isn't the real thing, tomorrow's may be. SAC must be capable of immediate response to major aggression anywhere by the best means at hand. Its planes have the range for it. By refueling in flight, they can deliver nuclear bombs to any place on Earth. This is a highly flexible method of delivery. It can be recalled, delayed, or shifted to a new target. But the time to target is measured in hours. Delivery by a ballistic missile, on the other hand, is less flexible, but very fast. When it's launched, it goes, and it gets there in minutes. We're lucky to have both. Very lucky indeed, because the early rocket experiments of Dr. Robert Goddard were largely ignored. No Teddy Roosevelt appeared in the nick of time. Those who did show up couldn't see the idea for the hardware. And the hardware wasn't impressive. There is always a board of ordnance and fortification to which so many people belong. And the board members know how to handle people like Goddard. The device must be brought to the stage of practical operation without expense to the United States. And it was by the Nazis. Borrowing freely from Goddard's published reports, they established a crash program for rocket development. Two types of missiles were produced. The larger, the V-2, carried a ton of explosive at a speed of 3,600 miles an hour. It came too late to affect the outcome of the war. But it spread terror in London and no one knows what the result might have been had it arrived earlier and in greater numbers. Today, several missile generations later, the Atlas, 
makes the implication of Goddard's ideas all seem so obvious. Not to mention our other ICBM systems, the Titan. And the Minuteman, the newest ballistic deterrent. But if hindsight is applied to any part of this story, the point is missed. It's not ended. Another chapter is being written somewhere. And all of us may very well play a role in it. Men of vision must always emerge as they have in the past. So ask yourself, would you have seen through Goddard's Tin Lizzy hardware to the magnificent idea itself? Would you have seen through the Wright brothers' animated kite to their magnificent idea? Would you have looked beyond the rickety little biplanes of Mitchell's armada and understood his dazzling concepts? You would? Fine. Stay around. You'll be needed in the space age.